how could we have been so theologically ignorant? We did not understand grace. But this was catastrophic uh, because it challenged everything. I don't know of anything like this that has ever happened. It was a showdown. It was a Dodge City high noon. It's nothing short of miraculous. It's the whole belief system that's in error. It can't be fixed. It has to be demolished. around the world and the united this states the at this moment is having its great strength the big and news its power today fell on a world too stunned and calloused by years of history Broadcast, now what about us news. the bible identifies we us. are israel today tribulation is coming the very next thing prophesied. and it is the implement and the church of what satan happened to hitler according to bible prophecy and how the war will go for america our people have just suffered the worst week of this war the blackest week of the entire century to date. Now you wonder, where are we going from here? The world is in trouble, and the United States is approaching trouble, many troubles. And it's all written in the Bible, and you can't understand it without this knowledge of our identity. Now, haven't you always heard the teaching that we're saved by grace? Oh, my friends, what poppycock. When will we wake up? You have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ but rather a false gospel, which represents Jesus Christ as a smart aleck young man who came to do away with his father's law. It was a time of great turmoil and uncertainty, and he tended to capitalize on that and grab people's attention, but it was based on fear. He'd have you uh, holding the newspaper in one hand and reading the Bible in the other hand. Russia now has the H-bomb. They now have a new type explosive that will destroy a whole nation. Let me repeat. He that spoke with authority. He sounded practical, pragmatic, forceful. And who was the man behind this voice? Uh, the man was Herbert W. Armstrong. Well, Herbert Armstrong was a, an advertising man, and he was a gifted advertising man. But one day in the 1920s, his wife said that she had learned that Sabbath keeping was something required for Christians. So he went to the public library, studied everything he could about religion, history of Christianity. Well, in going through all this, he concluded that his wife was right. He came across writings that advanced a theory known as uh, Anglo-Israelism or British Israelism. British Israelism is the belief that the tribes of Israel are the modern day nations of Western Europe, particularly Britain and America, who would be Ephraim and Manasseh. British Israelism was one of his main supports for why he believes Saturday, the Sabbath, should be kept, as opposed to the majority of Christians going to church on Sunday. His reasoning was, well, these are the ten tribes of Israel, they've lost their identity. If they knew they were part of the house of Israel, then they would understand that the Sabbath is a covenant they should be keeping for eternity. Well, Herbert Armstrong began on a tiny radio station in Eugene, Oregon. In 1933, he went on the radio. In addition to that, he started a mimeograph magazine. And don't forget, send your name and your address just right away now, before you forget it, for your free copy of the Plain Truth magazine. To he Herbert began to feel that God had selected him to be his great end-time prophet to tell the world that the United States and Britain were actually descended from ancient Israel. My friends, do you know the astounding, astonishing news that the people of the United States today are naturally, physically born Israelites? Do you if the United States was the descendant of Israel, then America would be involved in the prophecies, the Bible prophecies. And I want to tell you that all this weather disturbance means a terrible famine is coming on the United States that is going to ruin us as a nation inside of less than 20 more years. All right, I stuck my neck out right there.
You just wait 20 years and see whether I told you the truth. God says, if a man tells you what's going to happen, wait and see. If it doesn't happen, he was not speaking the word of God. He's speaking out of his own mind. You watch and see whether these things happen. You see who's speaking to you, my friends. Mr. Armstrong's drawing card was speculative prophecy. He made a lot of predictions about the near future using his keys of Bible prophecy to predict the actual return of Jesus in 1975. People ate the prophecy up and the program became enormously popular. It didn't seem to matter to people though when the predictions didn't come true. Uh, Mr. Armstrong seemed very adept at sidestepping the issue for the most part. But people just accepted it. And have we turned back to God's Sabbath? Oh, how we profane the holy things of God. If the United States didn't begin to turn back to God by keeping the Sabbath, an impending disaster was going to occur to the United States. It is the time of the greatest national trouble on the United States of America that has ever happened. It's coming very, very soon. And so his mission became one of, of, of a warning message to warn the United States and Britain to turn back to God through Sabbath keeping. You're under grace, so they tell you. I say, wake up, my friends. You've been deceived. The true gospel is the gospel of obedience to God. And so many people would hear him on the radio and they would say, well, now there's somebody that speaks with authority. There's somebody that's calling us back to a faithfulness and an obedience to God. There's somebody that takes the Bible seriously. Uh, Herbert Armstrong taught that the true gospel wasn't preached from about 50 A.D. forward. And then he was restoring the true gospel. He reduced Jesus to more of a messenger. He went on to say that the gospel is not about Jesus. Rather, the gospel is a message that Jesus was preaching, and that is the coming of his kingdom, the, the world tomorrow, hence the name of his radio program. The world tomorrow. The Radio Church of God presents Herbert W. Armstrong, bringing you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. So I rushed inside and told her to turn the radio on. But when he rushed in and said, it's on now, turn it on, it's different, you'll, you'll see, turn it on. And I turned it on, and he was talking about the world tomorrow. And that whole concept really grabbed my attention. I heard that, that uh, radio program and I became interested um, immediately. I sent away for uh, the Plain Truth magazine. People were captivated and as they listened, they believed. And as they believed, they donated. And as they donated, the work of Herbert Armstrong grew and grew and grew. Radio was the dominant media, of course, and you couldn't get away from Herbert Armstrong uh, as a religious broadcaster. And it was very easy to be attracted to his style his demeanor and so uh, a church began to be born he began to receive letters and the letters said I like what you're saying I believe what you're saying none of the churches around here teach this where can I go to church uh, Herbert Armstrong said well the radio is your church go to church every week by faithfully listening to this radio broadcast and in fact indeed that's the origin of the name the radio church of God well that seemed to be okay for a while but more and more people began writing in and there began to be groups from the major cities across the US and people wanted to become a part of this new movement so Herbert Armstrong saw that he was going to have to train people to go out and serve and minister to his radio audience so he moved down to California and found some property in Pasadena that looked like it would work and moved his operation to this area. So that was the origin of Ambassador College in about 1947 with four students and then over the years it began to grow. As we built congregations across the United States we played connect the dots so that we had many churches dotting the nation. Well, very early on, it was clear that uh, Herbert Armstrong was the work. So what was the role of the member? He said, I'm the one who takes the gospel to the world. 
I'm the one that God has given the message to. You're a support for me. You can pray for me, and you can donate your money. It was the teaching of our church that a tithe of your income is required of God. And with that kind of financial backing, uh, the ministry grew. This media message was blanketing the United States. It was also spreading across the rest of the world. This spread to Australia, Britain, Germany, France, Netherlands, Italy, the Middle East, Malaysia, uh, the Philippines. And this gospel is going to go around the world. And when it has circled this earth and gone around the world, then, and not until then, and not after then, shall the end of this age come. It went from radio to worldwide Church of God. British Israelism was a very important part of the Worldwide Church of God. It was our identity. That was our identity, being distinct from others. And we viewed that primarily in terms of Sabbath and Holy Days, these laws that made us different from mainstream Christianity. Mr. Armstrong taught that the true Sabbath was Saturday. And of course, Saturday is the seventh day of the week, and God gave that to Israel as a sign. But he said that unless we keep the Sabbath, we're not really Christians, thus condemning the rest of Christianity who don't keep Saturday uh, as unbelievers. Uh, added to that was the seven holy days that you find in the book of Leviticus. Add to that a condemnation of the Trinity. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. I used to sing that song before I knew better. I don't sing it anymore because it's as fake and false as it can be. We believe that God was the Father and that Jesus Christ was the Son, but that the Holy Spirit was a power by analogy like unto electricity. Our identity as the one and only true church was intriguing. It was a real hook to get people. The World Tomorrow. From the World Tomorrow first became a television program in 1955. Well, greetings, friends. Then he began to turn things over, of course, to his son, Garner Ted, who was younger, uh, very handsome. The influence of Garner Ted Armstrong in the early growth of Worldwide Church of God can't be minimized. He was the voice of the world tomorrow beginning in the 60s. It was his voice that people heard. Well, greetings, friends. This is Garner Ted Armstrong bringing you the good news of the world tomorrow. They were quite a dynamic duo, quite, quite a media team that could reach a variety of audiences all across the nation. And as a result, their work grew and grew and grew. Garner Ted Armstrong was more visible for many years. Uh, but Mr. Armstrong, his dad, was always the ultimate authority. It was based on a, on a theological holding that he was the only true apostle of Jesus Christ in this age. You had God the Father, Jesus Christ, Herbert Armstrong. And usually those who pressed him on control issues, authority issues, governance issues, found themselves out of a job and excommunicated from the church. Over the years, the relationship between Herbert Armstrong and his son, Garter Ted, uh, appeared to become strained. It was a huge blow to the church to learn that Garner Ted Armstrong had some moral failings back in the uh, early 70s. It finally came to a head, and I really think that the head was not only over the inappropriate behavior, but also to a power challenge, a threat to the position of the father for control of the organization. And it finally came to a point where uh, Herbert Armstrong excommunicated his son, and that's how those things were dealt with. So people learned, don't challenge Herbert Armstrong. After Garnetid Armstrong was excommunicated, uh, there was a hole left in the media ministry of the church, but Herbert Armstrong stepped right back into it, and he was really good at it too, and the church continued to grow. Although the membership of the church was just over 150,000, the influence of the church and its mission and ministry 
was far more extensive. The Plain Truth magazine became quite popular to war. Eight million copies worldwide, one of the largest circulated magazines in the world. The Worldwide Church of God is uh, genuinely a globe-spanning church. The number of countries is well over 50 or 60. That was merely a, a, a factor of, of media penetration and response. By the time he was on television in his later years, he was in his late 80s, early 90s. There'll be change from human to divine. There'll be change from man to God. Mr. Armstrong taught that members of the church would eventually become gods. Someday when you are made immortal and you become God yourself. Because that made all, all feel good. You know, that yeah, feels great. We'll be God. The road to godhood was filled with strange things like no birthdays, no Christmas, ladies couldn't wear makeup, uh, and you, if you went to the doctor, that was a lack of faith. We had a theology of not trusting doctors and instead just totally relying upon prayer for healing. Jesus had a perfect body. He was never sick a day in his life. He never had an ache or a pain. God is your own divine healer, not any man. Now, a lot could be said about that because as Herbert Armstrong got older, he used doctors a lot. Still, he continued to teach that it was wrong. That didn't help the people who needed doctors. When I was about five, my mom died. Uh, we thought it was cancer at the time, but the church taught that we should not go to doctors, so she refused to go to a doctor. In his 90s, Mr. Armstrong was too ill to continue without medical help, and that played a part in him finally having to choose a successor. Now, the problem for Herbert Armstrong was, who can I trust? His problem for decades had been he trusted no one. Well, of all things, there was a man who had risen from what was considered a very low position in the ministry, but had shown very much a great deal of zeal and loyalty for Herbert Armstrong for no reason, for no power. Therefore, he was the one that could be trusted to have the power. So Herbert Armstrong, among a variety of people, all who were vying for the position to be a successor, chose Joseph Dukat Sr. The fact that Herbert Armstrong had decided to choose a successor contradicted the teaching which I as a pastor had preached about that he was the Elijah to come or wouldn't die until Jesus Christ returned. I am a voice crying out in the wilderness and I'm here to bring you the truth because you don't hear this from any other voice. No one else is telling you the things that God is telling you through me. He's speaking through me. He has sent me here to talk to you, to give you his word. There was one leading minister who uh, was a high-ranking uh, man who was asked to travel throughout the nation giving messages to all the churches, uh, literally said that Herbert Armstrong is prophesied of in the Bible. He is God's anointed. He is the Elijah to come. He is the Malachi and he cannot die before Christ comes. And here's the statement he literally said, if Herbert Armstrong dies before the return of Christ, then the Bible is not true. I really thought that he was going to live until Christ returned. And this is the room Mr. Armstrong died in. He died right here in a chair, at this spot, right here sitting in a chair. And his bed was right there. And. Uh, that was January 16th, 1986. I remember the, the day he died. I expected something significant to happen because he had set himself up as a person of significance, as the crucial end-time apostle for the leader of the church. So he died and, well, the end isn't here yet. Uh, in some ways, it was that's kind of like a question that I just compartmentalized, put it on the shelf. My mother um, 
bless her heart, said, Greg, we've been in a cult and I apologize to you. I was Dean of Students at Ambassador College when she told me this. So at the time, I really dismissed a lot of what she said. But after a year or two or three, I began to think about it, particularly around about the time of Herbert Armstrong's death, which was in 1986. And that was a serious time of reevaluation. I began to look into British Israelism. And that was the uh, first major teaching of Armstrongism that I found to be completely bogus, completely so bizarre that when I when I considered what a bizarre thing that I had held near and dear for decades and how off the wall it was and completely without any biblical or historical foundation, I was mad, I was uh, upset, I was uh, disappointed in myself, I was um, disillusioned with people who had taught me this. Once I had proven to myself that he was wrong in something major like that, I was quite willing uh, cognitively to consider that he was wrong in other things, and indeed that I had been wrong. And of course, when you consider that he had been wrong, that's a little easier to do than to consider that you had been wrong. <laughs> that's the nasty part. That's the ugly part. That's the really hard part. Uh, for me personally, I was a, a sincere, ardent believer of British Israelism. And when I saw evidence that it was false, um, I didn't accept it at first. Science and, and history, um, archaeology, have all combined to disprove this as just an absolutely untenable theory. Um, I mean, to the extent that DNA studies have been done, and there's the, the theory just does not hold up at all. And the more I began to read about it and its historical origins, and I saw that it was bogus, um, then everything fell in place and my worldview changed. And my, my dilemma was, what do I do now? I have discovered serious flaws in Armstrongism. Uh, it's, not, it's not accurate. And, uh, and I, I thought, well, can I quietly leave and mind my own business? Uh, uh, no, how, how does the son of the, the current denominational leader quietly leave? Herbert Armstrong died, and for the first time, I was confronted with looking at his teachings critically when they rather than just well this is God's message from through God's anointed apostle eventually we came to the issue of the Trinity I read all the church history books I could get a hold of and I began to see that actually Herbert Armstrong knew nothing about really the history of the formulation of, of the doctrine and what what the implications were and what what it stood for what it meant why it mattered None of that was present in anything he wrote. I found that so disconcerting that to, as to be depressing. Here was an issue that was so large that it, was, that it defined the corruption of all the other churches. We had the Sabbath and Holy Days defining us as the one and only true church, but you had the Trinity defining everybody else as having been deceived by the devil back in the 300s and deceived ever since. And then to see that this was completely bogus, false argument from beginning to end. He had no idea what he was talking about, didn't know what was at stake, and built this huge condemnation of Christianity in general, of, of uh, traditional Christianity, on something that was completely preposterous. And furthermore, the doctrine was a good, sound, biblical doctrine rooted in Scripture on the fact of Scripture's demand that there is only one God and Scripture's demand that Jesus Christ is God and that the Holy Spirit is God, which can't be refuted in Scripture. I remember going through a period of kind of depression and trying to think it through, trying to pray for you know, some kind of stability, you know, what, how to, where to go next, what to do. I mean, it was clear to me then that this was not the one and only true church. The question is, did it have any validity as a church at all? 
And then what do you do? Is there an obligation I have to that? What am I supposed to do with that? Joe Dukach, Jr., his father was senior, and Mike Fazell and I eventually kind of found each other uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And we uh, determined through questions if the other person was safe or not. And we would test the other person to see if they would keep our confidence, if we could actually talk to them about what we were really thinking. We came face to face with the fact that the Trinity is the only biblical, logical answer on the nature of God, and that what Herbert Armstrong was teaching was polytheism. They seemed to realize that we share many of the same disagreements with the teachings of Herbert Armstrong. We all seem to be coming to similar conclusions. Um, what's going to happen when we take these to Joe Tkach? We got together with my dad and, uh, and shared with him our research. I didn't know how he would react. If it was just me, I'd have been out of a job. Um, if it was just Mike Fazell, he would have been out of a job. Coming to the realization of what was true and what was false, um, having a period of time of dilemma, what to do with the information, I was really gratified to see that my dad and my closest friends all said, let's start teaching the truth and uh, move out of the error. It is significant that all, all of us together were in agreement. Um, I look back on that and that, that's part of the miracle. When the leadership realized that there were serious doctrinal issues that had to be addressed, they formed a doctrinal team and they decided to just lay everything on the table and examine every single doctrine. We entered into this discussion then uh, in the doctrinal committee of the Trinity. First of all, you know, you think your friend Mike Fazell has gone crazy. You think Greg Albrecht has jumped off the edge. You think Joe Tkach is totally out of it. You know, where are these guys taking us? And, and, and because they are the leadership of the church and they're the ones articulating it. And then all of a sudden, you see, personally, this isn't what Mike Fazell or Greg Albrecht said. This is what God has led them to, now us to. It wasn't just one or two people making demands on somebody. It was a group of people who met in prayerful study every single week, going through doctrinal change after doctrinal change, and seeing scales stripped from eyes, veils lifted, light shining forth. But it has to be a work of God. It has to be the Holy Spirit opening mind after mind after mind. In learning that the Trinity was actually a true doctrine was a death blow to the idea that Herbert Armstrong was the one and only true end time apostle and that his church was the only true church. Why wouldn't I want the Trinity to be true? Why am I resisting something? I'm not just objectively looking at the Bible and saying, hey, what does it say? I'm not objective in this, and why not? I think for me it was because I wanted to write off other churches. So the issue is one of, does, does the Holy Spirit have personhood? And as I looked at that passage there, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, uh, we've been wrong, and that's where the light went on with the Trinity. We saw that the Trinitarian explanation of God's being and nature was absolutely correct and absolutely crucial and important for understanding uh, of the gospel message. But I didn't really have a relationship with Jesus. I thought I did, but, but I didn't because you can't until you understand that the message is about Him. How could we have been so theologically ignorant? How could we have embraced error to the degree we embraced it. Uh, and I still don't have the answer to that. I puzzle over it regularly. If uh, a church or a cult is wrong about the nature of God, they're wrong about many, many other things. I mean, that is, the nature of God is absolutely, you know, critical to being a Christian church. It was hard to just take that swallow and say, I've been wrong. I have misunderstood. And then when you've been in a teaching capacity, to say, not only have I been wrong, I have taught wrong. And that's sobering. So um, we begin to look at the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is 
God. Jesus has to be God, otherwise it wouldn't be right to worship him, that we don't worship a created being. Well, as one thing changed, it tended to raise questions about something else. In our doctrinal committee, we began to to study the implications of the New Covenant. There was enough controversy starting to swirl around this topic because the concept of the New Covenant was that the New Covenant requirements of a Christian are different from the regulations to a Jew in the Old Covenant. Bottom line. Uh, and the implication from that is Sabbath, Holy Days, tithing, requirements of the Old Covenant are not bound upon Christians in the New Covenant. That the New Covenant is based on better promises. All the promises that were given to Israel are fulfilled when God himself arrives on stage. He comes as one of us, yet remaining God, and takes humanity's cause up as his own. The new has arrived in the blood, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. That was when we finally realized that the Old Covenant law is what Hebrews says it is, that it really is obsolete. I'd have a checklist and say, oh yeah, and I'm doing okay there. Uh, I'm doing okay there. Well, I need help here. But it was a checklist mentality for me. And once I realized that my checklist didn't matter, not, you know, not only did it have the wrong things on it, but the whole idea of the checklist didn't matter. The authentic Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ, and it is not proven, it is not uh, uh, dictated or mandated by our performance, by how much we do, how often we do it, when we do it. We did not understand grace. We were in, in fact, uh, somewhat uh, grace-phobic. So all that stuff has to be scraped off, and our identity has to be in Jesus alone. Faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. That's it. That's our identity. I would have my own personal doubts about, boy, I'm not measuring up. When I saw that I'm under the new covenant, and when I understood the reality of grace, it's hard to describe the experience. I, I describe it as a waking out of a coma. That's how dramatic it was. Jesus died for our sins and gives us life and we don't deserve that. He gives us this gift of forgiveness and of all the sins we've ever committed in the past, all the sins that we will ever commit in the future, His grace covers it all. And they'll give me warnings like, you better be careful about that grace thing. You don't want to get too carried away with that grace stuff because you'll be encouraging people to sin. And I say, hey, we all sin, uh, you know, which side, you know, what planet did you wake up on this morning? We do sin. If there's no grace, if grace is not unconditional, if grace is not something God gives us to be received with joy and not with any conditions that we need to measure up to, then none of us have any hope whatsoever. The only hope I have is that Christ is full of grace and truth for me all the time, in spite of what I might do. We're completely forgiven because our walk is never perfectly pure. If God hadn't sent Christ, we have no hope. Christ brought something that did away with the whole game. He brought the gospel. The gospel says, all bets are off. Trust me, I've redeemed you. That's all there is to it. What the gospel does in receiving this grace from God that forgives us in spite of our sins is it moves us to want to please God all the more. When we trust Christ to forgive us, our hearts are turned towards Him. It isn't something that causes us to want to sin all the more. Why this opened our eyes to see what we'd been missing all along. This whole pile of legalism, this whole definition of our church because of its Sabbath and Holy Day keeping as being the only true church, all of that collapsed in an instant. And so one by one, uh, they 
little bricks in the wall began to crack and fracture and began to tumble. And when one brick began to fall, it was just a matter of time before all the bricks in the wall just fell down. The doctrinal team came to Christ, but that left them with a huge dilemma. How were they going to get the same wonderful truth across to all the members of the church? And my dad sitting there just kind of musing out loud with us, he said, you know, when we start explaining these things, uh, some people are going to get shook up, some people are going to leave. He said, I think it could be as high as half our organization will leave. And we said, you know what, it could be, it could be that high, we just, we, we don't have a clue. All we know is this is what's true and this is what isn't and what, we know what we should do. And I said, yep, that's right, we can't, can't deny that. Um, so we were all fully prepared for half the church to walk away overnight. Uh, we hoped that that wouldn't happen. It was over a period of time the leadership came to see it's the whole belief system that's in error. It can't be fixed. It has to be demolished. Are you either going to continue to be a cult or are you going to be a Christian? Which was it? And so my dad worked long and hard to prepare a sermon to explain that. In that sermon, Mr. Tkach acknowledged as a result of all of our studies that the New Testament does invoke the New Covenant and Jesus came to bring a New Covenant and that New Covenant does not carry with it the rules and regulations of the old. They are simply done away. The Lord of the Sabbath has come and the reality has replaced the shadow. The whole package was set aside and replaced by Jesus Christ. Salvation is a gift and it means that you cannot earn it in any way, shape, or form. We are a new covenant church. Our relationship with God is based on faith in Christ and not on the old covenant. The old covenant is obsolete. That was the shot heard round the world. It was a showdown. It was a Dodge City high noon. <laughs> it was the uh, OK Corral. When you have been a Sabbatarian, and you hear, done away, it, 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 there's nothing more shocking, nothing more shocking to your ears to say, the Sabbath is not required for Christians, is just like a clanging bell in your ears. You know, no, that can't be. I've been, for all these years, I believe, I believe it required, you had to do it. When he said that the rest is in Christ, not in a 24-hour period of time, people just, just, smoke came out of people's ears. Their fuses were blowing. <laughs> and uh, so it was an enormous conflict in the Worldwide Church of God. I was a pastor in South Africa when Joseph Takash said that the Sabbath was not demanded of Christians. It had a devastating effect on the church. This was catastrophic uh, because it challenged everything that I'd believed for 30 years. He must have been totally convicted to go that far because uh, predictably it, it was like a nuclear explosion that went off in the church. For, for Mr. Dukach to make such a statement about the Christian Sabbath that's totally, you know, diametrically opposite of what the church had taught for 50, 60 years. Well, members were uneasy about that because here's an apostle contradicting another apostle. Somebody's got to be wrong. After the service broke up, people were huddled in crowds. And they, people were in tears and some people were angry and people were talking. What does this mean? What's the significance of this? I remember sitting wide-eyed in church, listening to him that day and just very, very aware that things were changing, that these were not little changes, little doctrinal changes, that this was big. I remember walking back to my dorm and all of, all of the students were just kind of in a daze. And I remember 
kids on the phones to their parents at their, in their home congregations. Did you hear about this? What does that mean? You know, and 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 pretty quickly there was a a comparing of of stories. What have you heard? It would have been a good time to own stock in the telephone company because the phone lines were burning all over in our congregations, not just in the U.S. but all over the world, and uh, and that that's what began uh, the uh, momentum of change. Mr. Nakacha's sermon and some of the announcements were sent out worldwide via email. It became pretty bumpy pretty fast. Some loved it, some didn't, some were happy, some were not, some were saying I can accept this, some were saying I can't. The irony of it was people were saying literally something to the effect that we've always kept the Sabbath, we've always believed the Sabbath must be kept, we must obey God. He's saying we don't have to obey God, we don't have to keep the Sabbath, that can't be right. He's saying we don't have to keep the festivals. We've always been taught we have to keep the festivals to obey God. If we don't keep the festivals, we're sinning. And yet he says that we don't have to keep them anymore. That can't be right. He says that we don't have to tithe our money to the church anymore. That makes a lot of sense. And the first thing that happened, no matter what side of the ideology you were on, is the income of the church took a nosedive. Just like an airplane going down. Uh, and the graph is pretty dramatic when you see it in, in visual form of, uh, of what happened in 1995. Well, if you're an employee, and I was a supervisor, I had people under me, um, um, cutbacks. Well, you got, you're laying off people that have been working there 20, 30 years. Uh, my wife was laid off. Um, Media operations, the particular division that I was involved in, went from about a thousand employees down to, what are we now, 10? We had to manage uh, a, an organization in financial crisis as well as emotional crisis uh, with doctrinal changes that were impacted by that sermon. But how to take an organization from cultic standing and move it into the body of Christ. How do you do that? And it was all we could do to keep up with the questions that one change would raise that would lead to another because the implications of one thing generally impacted other issues. And so we found ourselves on a runaway train and it's not like we were driving the train um, it's as if someone put a brick on the accelerator and we were all just hanging out in the train doing the best best we could. The sacrifice uh, to the church itself in terms of membership uh, was tremendous. The, uh, going into these changes, the church had approximately 150,000 members and coming out the other side, uh, when all is said and done, there were only a, a little less than 60 thousand left and uh, those many of those went to splinter groups our fellowship was devastated it was fragmented it was shattered and the majority left so I can't say that the majority held the Word of God above the doctrines of Herbert Armstrong those who wound up staying were people who went to the Bible to see whether these things are so. They went to Scripture, they studied it, they let the Scriptures speak to them, and they could see that what the church was doing was being faithful to the Bible. But those who let the Bible speak to them, instead of Herbert Armstrong, those are the ones who made the change. I move away all the literature from the church. So I would start, begin zero, and I started reading the book of Romans, Galatians, Hebrews. And then suddenly it seems like somebody turned on the light. And I, I finally, you know, it, it was so clear, especially going through the book of Galatians. And I remember closing our room, closing my bedroom, and I was literally dancing. <laughs> so it's like this big weight just off me. And I was just so happy. And I would ask God to guide me and it didn't it didn't feel confusing anymore. It just felt like the fog was was lifted. It wasn't until the thought came to me 
suppose this is of God and I'm rejecting him. And that's what took me to my knees. And I, I talked to God about it. I said, if this is of you, I do not want to reject it. If, in fact, I do have a veil over my eyes, please remove it. And it was almost instantly after that prayer, as I read the word, it was like reading a new book. But for me, it was just kind of like the veil had been lifted. And I could say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Then when you reread the New Testament, it's amazing all the difficult scriptures we used to spend hours explaining away suddenly weren't difficult. They were like written in plain English. God's truth is revealed. Yes. When I found out quite clearly that the Holy Spirit is a person, I prayed and I said, Holy Spirit, I don't know you. I want to know you. After I prayed that prayer and asked him to help me to understand, he really did. So he became very real, and the scriptures related to the changes began to t make more sense. When I became aware that the Holy Spirit was a person and that he desired to live in me and work through me, uh, there's a tremendous sense of, of this togetherness with God. Our old preaching was, you know, a good sermon was if it really beat us over the head and really stood up for the truth like an Old Testament prophet and really told everybody off about their sins, you know, and you could go away feeling just right guilty, that was a good sermon. Oh, it was powerful. You know, we would, didn't want to hear sermons on love, you know, that was weak and insipid and did nothing. It was just silly claptrap, you know. When somebody comes to church, they don't need to leave with a burden of guilt. The gospel removes burdens of guilt. That's the point. That's what Hebrews uh, says that Christ's blood did as opposed to the sacrifices. It takes away the guilt. It takes away, it, it cleanses us. It's an amazing thing. It says it cleanses us of a guilty conscience. Now, it's not wrong to meet on Saturday or a Sunday or a Monday. It's not wrong to keep a birthday or not keep a birthday. It's not wrong to keep a Christmas or not keep a Christmas. But you become a cult and everything you do becomes a standard of righteousness. Well, all this is lost on us when you're, when you're legalistic. So after the changes, my preaching took on a totally different tone. Mike Fazal was giving a, a sermon, and I remember he kept talking about this God that loves you personally, who cares about you, who knows your wounds and, and your afflictions and, and things that you're going through, and how he wants to meet you in that place, and how he's available to you, and we didn't, we didn't talk about Jesus. And so we're be being introduced to this Jesus. And of course, he's always been in the Word. How we missed that, I don't know. But here he was coming through in the worship. He's, he's speaking to my heart. Here he is in Mr. Fazal's message. And it was the first time, you know, in worship that as, as we stood up to sing again at the end of the service, that I lifted my hands in worship. And let me tell you, I was self-conscious. I don't know. We didn't do this. But all I knew at that moment is, I want to praise this God. I'm going to I'm going to raise my hands, and I am going to give him praise. And I, I just had to do it, and I did right then and there. And worship, worship to my God has never been the same after that moment. He knows my name. willing to sing about Jesus, we're willing to sing about love, uh, because it had, an, had made an impact on our lives. It was no longer just singing by rote. Those who didn't make the change, who were committed to Armstrongism, simply went to their proof texts to reinforce what they'd always heard rather than letting the Bible 
in its full context speak to them. There were others who left us that held the doctrines of Herbert W. Armstrong over the Word of God. And many of those folks refused to look at any literature or explanation the church was giving. And I had a friend who would get a mail packet from us in Pasadena, and he told me this personally. He said, I slammed it in the trash can without even opening it. I didn't want to know what kind of trash you people were disseminating. Well, how can you learn? I asked him, how can you possibly know? How can you know if it's right or wrong if you won't even read it? I don't even want to know. I know it's wrong before I read it. And to this day, he's in one of the other derivative church movements. One of our presenters who, in disagreeing with our new doctrinal position, said, and you understand he disagreed with it, said, when it comes to this, you either see it or you don't. I agree with him. He didn't see it. He, of course, thinks I'm the one who didn't see it. They clung to Moses. And as long as they have Moses, they have a veil over their eyes. And we who have seen that, the veil has been stripped away. And we now see the glorious light of the gospel of grace in a way we never could or did before. We went from a position of uh, error and blindness to a position of spiritual sight. Christ showed a lot of mercy and guided my path in a way that's very apparent looking back, or I would not have processed the changes, I would have rejected them. It was, it was devastating. It was devastating. I have never experienced anything like it. The painful part of our change was that many who walked with us before no longer walk with us. Um, that's the saddest part. Dear friends, uh, that's uh, just kind of turned their backs on you. Uh, it was it was very very difficult. Some some people divorced over it. Uh, some families still don't talk with each other. Uh, just a lot of pain from from that. Houses divided over that, and and the kids just you remember their tears. My mom and dad left, and my brothers, and that was hard for me. Um, we just talk about the weather and things like that, you know. That's hard. To see people that I laughed with and did things together with, you know, and when I see them, they would not speak to me. That hurt. But uh, God healed. You know, you pray for them. I still pray for them. We still have hope for them, and we still pray for them, and we still remember them. We had to start making decisions that were extremely difficult. We went off of television. We closed the university. Major trauma, of course, major emotional trauma to us. Uh, but in order to meet declining income, we had to trim expenses. So it was a, a very, very emotionally stressful, difficult time. I give a lot of credit to those who were in leadership positions at that time that they had the courage to do that, not worrying about loss of power, loss of prestige, loss of finances, loss of self. My dad had a tumor in his colon and, uh, and it was uh, malignant and, it, and during that time he, he told me that uh, he was going to present to the board of directors that I should succeed him. Joseph Dukach chose his son to succeed him because he wanted to be sure that the changes that he had inaugurated would continue on. Every step of the way when Joseph Dukach Sr. would 
make a commitment for Christ vis-a-vis -vis Armstrongism. He would have those of us who said that's the right decision and he would have far more people who were good friends of his, companions, longtime friends, who would uh, tell him he was an idiot, a fool, he was uh, a heretic, he was a, you know, whatever, and it tore him up. He had an existing condition of a cancer, but uh, most of us believe that that was hastened by the incredible stress, and he died uh, prematurely. charge to me was to finish, finish the job and uh, be faithful. And I took that seriously and uh, still do. Joseph Gosch Jr. is gracious and um, inclusive uh, and warm and gentle, which the Worldwide Church of God desperately needed after Herbert Armstrong. Armstrongism, one of the things it bred in us was that the higher you got up in the organization, the more answers you were supposed to have, and uh, that inflates your ego. And in the transition, I thought, you know, I don't have to pretend that I'm any more special than anybody else. I'm just a normal guy who uh, struggles with life, and, and I found it so refreshingly um, freeing to teach people we're all sinners and we all need Jesus. And I can't help but think back to Saul of Tarsus, who had been persecuting the church and killing Christians, and then Barnabas comes and says, look who I'm bringing in here, it's Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> no way, no thank you, uh, don't trust him. Oh, it's okay, he's changed now. Yeah, uh, sure, uh, you can say that, but I'm not sure I'm ready to believe that. We found ourselves in much that same position, and understandably so. In the history um, of our organization, one of the phrases that was used was that we're the obedient true Christians, we're the authentic Christians, and all the other churches are disobedient and Christians falsely so-called. Um, of course, that was um, an egregious error on the part of our organization. Um, and for anyone that we've offended with that kind of rhetoric, you have our sincerest apology. There were those who were like Barnabas, praise God, who accepted us, encouraged us, and helped us. I think the thing that pushed me over the edge of believing that this was a true miracle was to see what the Worldwide Church of God gave up, what they sacrificed to make right decisions that were um, based on uh, biblical truth. The transformation of the worldwide church of God is absolutely genuine. There's no possible motive for them doing what they did unless it was driven by a pursuit of truth. I can't imagine anyone uh, willfully choosing to bring upon themselves the kind of burden and struggle that the Worldwide Church of God has chosen to bring upon itself uh, f for any reason. The only reason I can imagine people would want to do that is if they really firmly believe in their heart that this is of God and this is truth and this is right. I don't know of anything like this that has ever happened where you have an organization, not just a number of individuals, but an organization that has come from cultism to Christ and who overtly count the cost. Watching the Worldwide Church of God uh, shift its theological center uh, is, is nothing short of miraculous. Uh, 
I, I, I have no other way to describe it. Yes, he has done the most powerful thing in our midst already by transforming us from all the errors to embracing Jesus as the person of truth. God in his infinite love and wisdom and mercy to us stepped in and said, I want to work a miracle in the 20th century. I want to bring a group of people out of error, out of theological heresy. <laughs> so we're still here and uh, credit goes to God. What can I say but thank God? God did this in spite of us. Oftentimes we got in the way and God could remind us that, you know, you guys just need to get out of the way and let me do this. And, and you just watch and then you report on it. You just tell the church what I'm doing. You don't need to do something and then report what you're doing to the church. You report what I'm doing to the church. How about that? Let's try that for a while. <laughs> but it was a painful process. And, uh, but now that, that I, I realize the, the wonderful freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, the liberty that we have in our relationship with God, it's, uh, it was worth it. I'd do it again. I'd do it again ten times. <laughs> it's one of those things where you tell God, Father, I don't ever, ever, ever want to experience this again. In fact, I don't think I could take it. But thanks a lot. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Was he a false prophet? Yes, I believe Herbert Armstrong was a false prophet. <laughs> the facts speak to that. Um, was he a heretic? I believe he was a heretic, but I believe I was a heretic too. So I'm not attributing anything to him that I'm not willing to face myself. And there was a time when I was angry with Herbert Armstrong. I came to the point in my life when I said, I blame Greg Albrecht for giving control of Greg Albrecht's life to Herbert W. Armstrong. Forgiveness is a very important part uh, when a person has been involved in uh, cultic teaching. It was impossible for me to forgive anybody unless I accepted God's forgiveness first. Um, and I found that I didn't really, it was hard for me to accept God's forgiveness because most people don't want to because you have to admit that, that God is God and you are you and that you've done bad things and you know so that's hard and so but then when you do accept God's forgiveness he empowers you to forgive others you can't forgive anybody that's that's outside of the human capabilities to go and forgive people the way the Bible speaks of forgiveness the, the God's forgiveness. So um, I began to see that that's the way I could forgive people. And then you can learn to love other people in the same way that God loves you because it is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit that enables us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so with God's unconditional love for the first time in your heart, you can have unconditional love for your fellow human. As a parent, I regret the legalistic way that I brought up my children. I regret my legalistic tactics. I did not, when I first heard that God's love was unconditional, I said, no, it's not. God's love is very conditional. That was my mindset as a parent. I am. I was constantly trying to be good and so therefore there was always a feeling of, of condemnation. You constantly had guilt that you weren't going to make it because you weren't righteous enough. It was a constant uh, uphill battle to be perfect. And you always had to perform. You know, get your tithes in, attend the festivals, uh, keep the Sabbath. Looking back now and having the understanding that I now have, 
Well, we just did not understand grace or what Jesus really came to do. Thank God he's delivered me from that. And I now know him as a God of love and who, who wants to include me in his love. A tremendous blessing. Thank you, Father. I began to understand that my works, my effort, was like filthy rags. And that I began to understand that is why there's Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ. In the past, we taught tithing as a strict legalistic thing. And now I tithe and give offerings, but it's because of gratitude, a response to God's love, not because there's a hanging judge waiting to smash me. My wife and I have a dream of going back to Africa one day. And the main reason we want to do it is I'd like to go back to where I was first a pastor, which is now the country of Zimbabwe, where I taught them the old way. And I taught them very successfully. We had a church that grew and grew and grew. And then I left, and then the changes came, and people just left in droves. And I don't know where they are. But now that God has so graciously shown what he's really like and how much of the, the teaching that I used to have really was so wrong. My wife and I would love to go back and reach out to those people. There were all these intervening people, this intervening hierarchy between you and, and the person of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, my experience was that all the rest of that stuff was just pulled out and uh, now I have a direct uh, uh, relationship with, with Jesus himself. That's all that's necessary. Uh, when you come to the realization that there is really nothing you can do to earn salvation, you get the ultimate release from anxiety. And so I, I saw myself trying to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, walking behind him, following along the way, and then one day Jesus sat down on a rock and let me catch up and sat down beside me, put his arm around me and welcomed me into his life. And, and, and that's the difference. Now he's my savior, he's part of my life, he's in my heart. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad he sat down on that rock and waited for me. I'm just very thankful he did. It had to be gone. It had to be God, the Holy Spirit, moving through the church as Christ led the church where he needed to take us. Early on, we were asked, well, why don't you change your name? One of the reasons we didn't rush into changing the name of the church is that uh, God has performed a miracle here. Uh, we don't want to run away from the miracle. We don't want to hide that miracle. Our greatest testimony is what Jesus has done to us and how he's transformed us. Where I see the work of the Holy Spirit in the transformation of the church is in the humility of, of humans who have power, who have prestige, who have comfortable incomes, uh, even uh, very luxurious surroundings, and are willing to lay all that aside for the sake of what does Scripture say and what does God want the financial struggle, the emotional struggle, the personal struggle. Not a person will say it wasn't worth it. It was worth every dime's worth of struggle we've ever gone through or ever will go through. It has happened through, through prayer and through the work of the Holy Spirit. But otherwise, it's just simply not explainable. One of the pastors out there made reference to our church and and was talking about what can happen um, through the power of prayer and how members, including Jack Hayford, used to come to our campus and prayer walk the, the perimeter of our campus. I didn't know this. And here, years after they, they'd done this, our church has changed to accept grace by faith. And here I am sitting in his congregation. I wanted to stand up and go, I'm here, it worked, it worked, I'm here. God has uh, performed a, a marvelous miracle out of uh, his love for us. We ask, why us, Lord? Thank you, but why us? Uh, 
do you have a purpose for us? Do you, do you have a calling for us? Is, is there something that uh, we are to proclaim on your behalf? Are we to give hope that other cults might have hope that something wonderful could happen uh, in their midst? To contemplate that the Worldwide Church of God would be where it is today in its faith and in its beliefs uh, would be impossible to contemplate. I don't think that you know any organized group that calls itself a church that has ever changed its doctrines, that has ever admitted it had been wrong, that has ever admitted that it had taught something that it now finds was an error and admits publicly and tells the people it had been an error and now it preaches the truth. And yet, it, it has happened. But an organization that's come from cultism to Christ. Could it take place in other organizations? Yes. So yes, what happened in the Worldwide Church of God is a miracle. And it's, it's, it's an expression of the goodness of God that extends out and beckons everyone to come to Christ. And if in the end of it all, what do you have? You have your God, you have your Savior, you have the Spirit that lives in you, you have salvation assured. What can you say? It was, it was a miracle of the greatest designs in our life. And we pray for it in the lives of not only people we know, but in the lives of other organizations that someday, somehow, may come to the same miraculous life experience.